Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for best security practices for advocates working remotely. Today we will hear from Jasmine Amore, Satish Nori, and Scott Ellis. We will start off with a fact pattern that highlights key security issues, then we will discuss the best practices for advocates, and we'll wrap up with some tips for you to take with you. You are working on an important case with a pro bono attorney at a private law firm. There is suddenly emergency that it requires documents to be filed urgently. You need to get confident client information, share it with the pro bono attorney, and work to meet the deadline. This is unfolded while at the airport as you head to your cousin's wedding. You think, I've got time, six hour plane ride, I'll get it done in no time. On your personal MacBook, you log into the airport's public Wi-Fi, connect to the firm's remote terminal server, and email documents you need to your private email address to work on them from your Mac. You also text your client from your cell about documentation you need from your client. In flight, you connect to the free in-flight airplane wireless network, log into your 365 webmail to review the document from the pro bono attorney and save it to your laptop as well. You remote back into the terminal server and email yourself more files. You use your laptop email to save the email attachments to your laptop. Airdrop client images and documents to your laptop that were sent by text MMS to your personal phone and your client's emails more documents to your personal email. You've made it through the six hour flight into the hotel. As you unpack, your laptop flies out of your bag and onto the floor. It won't turn on. Fortunately, your Mac synced your documents to your Apple iCloud account. You run to the hotel's business center, open your iCloud account, download your documents, copy everything onto your handy USB key, and email everything to the pro bono attorney for filing. You get some rest, the next morning, while getting ready, you look for but can't find your USB key. You realize your USB key isn't encrypted and has client data on it. Enjoy kind the of, wedding. It, you can't really blame the attorney in this position, although, unfortunately, they took some shortcuts here. And I think that's what we're going to get into is some of the red flags. And, like, I would just say about taking those shortcuts, it's like we're all trying to get, our, you know, these our jobs done. We care deeply about what we're doing and unfortunately like sometimes especially when you're out and about and in public in these public places you need to take an extra moment to think about what what extra steps I might need to take to protect my client data and um, I think you know we're going to get into some of these red flags next um, so, so I I, yeah, yeah the next question, I guess, is what what stood out? What were a few, a handful of things that, you know, just made you cringe <laughs> in this stock pattern? Well, I, I, I'll go <clears throat> really quick first. That I, um, I would say, like, the one thing that, you know, is that this, obviously, this attorney felt like it was necessary to email documents to themselves, to their personal Gmail account which is a big red flag, obviously. Um, but I, I also see in this that they remoted into their um, terminal server at work, to their remote desktop at work. And like presumably were not able to do the work that they needed in that, um, using that system that their work had provided to them. So this is, I mean, I think this is a scenario where like we need to look at like, what the you know attorney could do better, which is like not use your personal account, <laughs> hopefully, and also you know maybe the employer needs to look at modernizing their system to using something like using a file like a cloud-based file sharing, so that attorneys can get access to their files. Um, this is something that you know we have really like pushed forward, and just even in the last three years is like we've recently moved everything on premises into uh, SharePoint. And I'm and I don't want to be a salesperson. I want to start out saying I'm not trying to be a salesperson for any platform or anything. I'm just mentioned some of the things that we do. And I hope in your your comments you maybe mention some of the things that you're doing as well and some of the tools that you're doing. But we found um, 
uh, SharePoint to be great um, <clears throat> for having a platform to share files with opposing counsel. So we're not like we're, we can maintain, uh, we don't have to be emailing back and forth all the time. There's like, we can be working on our files and, and they can be working on the same files and they can have access to the same systems we do. And I'll get into, we're gonna get that in, into that later. But that was like one of the big things is like, you know, for me that stood out is like that um, the personal device, but the per, not so much the personal device, but the personal account use was a big thing. Satish, as a caseworker and supervisor, what is your perspective about all of this? And, and how realistic is this fact pattern? I would say that this is very, very realistic. And not just because I helped come up with it, but um, this is something that happens. For example, I'm using my personal iPhone for work right now. <laughs> and that's probably, um, that's not in fact what my organization recommends. I'm supposed to carry a second um, work iPhone. Um, and I'm sure many people who are watching this right now may already have two phones. And you know what a hassle that is to have to charge two devices, to have to carry two devices, to have to check two devices all the time. Um, that's something that I think many people deal with, they face. The second thing is many of us prefer to use a Mac, for example. And at work, they make us use PCs. And when we get home, we open up our Macs or many new lawyers, for example, had Macs in law school and they continue to use them. Um, whenever I visit a law school, I'm, I'm struck by how prevalent Macs are um, in contrast to their prevalence in real legal environments where no Macs are used more, more or less, right? And so many new attorneys are probably using their Macs um, when they start their new jobs and they continue to use them at home. Maybe there are organizations where you don't get a device. Um, budgets are uh, tight and you're not gonna get an iPhone or a computer, a laptop or a tablet to use at home. So you have to get your own. Um, and then um, as we work remotely during the pandemic, I mean, how many people were given hotspots by their nonprofit organizations, not many. So how are you supposed to conduct work when you're sitting home because of the pandemic and it's not safe to go in? Um, you're using your personal Wi-Fi, or you're at Starbucks or you're at the um, bus station because you're traveling somewhere or uh, you're at the airport. So I think these are things that are very, very realistic. And then I think the other part about this fact pattern that's really critical is we're all working with emergency issues and we don't have time to think about what could happen because as legal professionals, we're worried about the legal outcome. Someone could get deported or evicted or not have a benefit that allows them to put food on the table or pay for necessities or pay for medicine. And so if we don't get things done quickly, then good things will not happen and bad things could happen to our clients. So I think all of these things are things that we deal with every single day. And I, as I said at the top, if we're gonna work from home, we're gonna see it more and more and more. Yeah, and I would re reiterate, and we, we see, uh, I mean, at least half of the students coming out of law school with Max. And they, you know, they want to use them and, and many of them, you know, are very great, you know, have learned, are very proficient um, with their device and just like the flexibility of just having one device. And so trying to set up a system that allows them to do that has been really, I've, has really helped us a lot. And we got it started before the pandemic, but we actually like invested in Microsoft's Intune uh, mobile device management 
And what that has allowed us to do is actually enroll these devices in our Active Directory um, and set some minimum security conditions on them. So we, before they can access our SharePoint sites, so we're actually like know where that data is. We have some site oversight of that data. Um, and we know that they're like, they have some minimum security standards, like they have to have a pin on their device and they have to have a password. So these are the kinds of things it was like realizing we're moving into a period where more and more people are going to want to be using their personal devices and it being hard right now to even get laptops like for, for people. It's, you know, it, it's, I think it's important as we uh, IT professionals is to realize this. And that's something like I was saying in the, this fact pattern, this employer, you know, it, it's, it needs to catch up with the times and get on the cloud um, and get, oh, maybe overcome some trepidation there might be to being on the cloud because there can be like in this particular instance, like losing the USB, you know, device, uh, thumb drive um, being the major incident, <laughs> you know, is, obviously something that could have happened way before we had the cloud. So um, yeah, I, I would say, so in the event, my, I know not everyone agrees personal devices should be in the mix, but I think like this is a reality that even if our, even if our staff is using a device, like our students that are volunteering for us are going to be using personal devices, probably and wanting to be using personal devices, Certainly outside council, we can't control what devices they're using, volunteers, uh, other organizations that, want, that we want to collaborate with. Like we need a platform that can work with everything. And like that is like what we need to look to and look to for security models that can, can, hold, can um, carry that. Satish, do you have any concerns around the, the communication with uh, some um, MMS texts, so picture messages, and some of the document sharing details that we added to our fact pattern? You know, that's a great question. Um, something that's really helped us is allowing our clients to text us things or to send us photographs. For example, if we're working on housing cases and we wanna show the judge the picture of the leak or the mold or the rat, um, it's great that our client can just open up their device and text it to us, sometimes on our personal device. And so it's been really effective in getting information from our clients and then communicating that information. And it's helped us win cases and really present claims in a clear way. It's also helped in getting documents like leases and rent receipts, um, social security statements, letters, notices from immigration. Um, people had to bring it to us in the past or they had to mail it to us and we'd have to wait for it to arrive or they'd have to go to a bodega and fax it to us. And sometimes they're charged like a dollar a page to do that. I know many of you have probably dealt with this kind of thing. Now they can just open up their phones and just text it to us. So the benefits are so tremendous. The questions become, well, like who else can get access to this type of information if it's being texted? And what happens if all this data that's on your personal device what happens if you lose your phone? What happens if you leave it somewhere? What happens if someone steals your bag and it has your laptop or your phone and all these text messages from your client? It has their documents. It has their social security number maybe. Um, so I think the analogy that I would use is it's like, now we have these shiny bicycles and there are bike lanes everywhere and we can ride them anywhere we want and get there quickly and cheaply, but we gotta wear helmets. And it's not because we are not good at riding bikes because we've been riding bikes since we were kids. It's because there are bad actors out there who are trying to crash into us, who are trying to throw us off our bikes and take our information and, and hurt us and hurt our clients. 
And so that's the thing that's really been challenging for me to understand. Um, and I think many of you may be in that boat too. It's like, well, I know what I'm doing. I text everyone all the time. Nothing bad ever happens to me. I text my mom and my sister and my friends and my kids. Um, so what's the difference here? And I think the difference is what we want to stress to you. It's that we have an obligation to our clients. And the risk is that something terrible could happen to our clients. And we'll talk about that. And I think Scott is, is an expert on some of these things. So I'm really glad that he's part of our group here. Oh, thank, thank you. I'm, thank you all for having me. And thank you, Satish, um, for your comments, for sure. Um, yeah, I, I think, it, you know, in this situation, I, I mean, th this is a perfect example, I think, of what we're, where you have to, there's a balance. Like, because when I think, you know, as an IT person, I'm looking at what is better but I'd rather have my client, you know, my staff emailing uh, the client with or texting, I would be like, well, email, like encrypted email. So then we're like, then we can pull that back if someone loses, you know, gets their email hacked or we can, we just have a lot more control over this. But then there are certain barriers that adds to the experience and like may not make us able to do as effective uh, and advocacy as we need to, or act as quickly as we need to. So, you know, we need to be, I think it's like imperative that advocates are telling us like what they need. And like, these are the, this is what I want to be able to do. Talk to, you know, talk to us and help us come up with solutions um, I, I, one thing we are, you know, in the process of doing, we, we had SMS built into our case management system previously, but we're moving to a new case management system and we do want to incorporate MMS into that to, for communication with our clients. And so this would be, I think, you know, is a, hopefully will be a solution to some of these things in terms of like governance. I mean, it's still not going to be an encrypted, um, However, it'll, you know, at least it'll not be on your phone, you know, sitting like if you lose your phone or you dump it in the water or whatever. Um, so again, like, I don't think there's a, I don't think there's perfect solutions here. I don't think like, we're not trying to give you a list of things that you should do. It's more of like, just to kind of get the, get things going, get some thoughts going. And Scott, can you talk a little bit about encryption and what that entails. And it, it's a word we all use, uh, but what does it really mean? And how do we go about it? And what, and if you do have some tools that you might think are helpful uh, for the legal community, um, of course, respecting the governance and the guidelines established by individuals, organizations, IT policies, because you should always follow those first. But uh, can you give us some more insight around how we should uh, handle encryption if we did need to share uh, documentation with clients. Um, well, in the la in, I would say in the la in the last six months, it's become much more of a, a pressing issue because of lay advocates in our organization who told us like we really need an email encryption. Like we're handling, you know, um, some of them, you know, health information immigration, like very sensitive immigration information. Um, and we, we absolutely need this. And, and I, you know, frankly, I was like, really, like, there's not a way around this. And the more I looked into it, the more I saw the advantages with email encryption, which, um, which we use, like we have Gmail um, and G Suite and we're using Virtru. Um, which is really it, it integrates with and makes it a little bit easier for staff to use. But I've been hearing some complaints about other outside counsel who don't like the way it works and don't like the extra, you know, um, bit to it. But what it does allow us to do, and we've actually had this situation happen where one of our, uh, another organization in our state had a manager had a, an email hack, her email hacked and was used for phishing. Um, and was and sending out to like uh, like many people in our organization around the state, and we I was able to go in and and every, any email that she was on that had an encrypted message, which there was only there were only a few at that point, but I was able to disable her access to that. So it's like 
I don't think we think about, I mean, it's something that really became clear to me is like, hey, with encryption, it's like that email is gone, but I can still lock it down after it's gone. I can remove access to that email and those attachments and everything, even after it's out the door. So I think that's really cool. And I see that as really the future of this kind of zero trust model of security that we're moving to. I'm, I, I, I see also like, in, and I've been in investigating encryption in Office 365 and in SharePoint and they with sensitivity labels. And Microsoft is really heavily like investing in this as a, as a future security model where we can encrypt not only were like Office 365 documents, but PDFs using like Azure's like encryption information protection, um, and we can set limits on how long someone can, you know, have a, a document offline. So we can say like every three days they need to log in and confirm their access to that file. So it's like if they if so in this fact pattern, I think like we're looking at like even if this attorney is using an unencrypted thumb drive, which, you know, hopefully they're not, but of course, like people, you know, don't take the time to lock down their thumb drives. I don't do it. Um, honestly, like it's not something I think about doing and I mean, don't, not dealing with client data as much, but I, you know, but if we had those encrypt, if the, if the files that we had on the, there were encrypted files that they had downloaded from our SharePoint site, we wouldn't have to worry about it. Because like anyone who got a hold of those files would not be able to authenticate in and get access to what was in there. So right. I, yeah. That's great. We have a question in the chat. Uh, what about using password protected documents via email? Uh, this is something that um, maybe we've seen. So we work with a partner organization and they use encryption for every single email that they send and each recipient has to log in and create a password. And of course, I can never remember my password. So I get these emails and they're always marked urgent. And then I have to click forget password and get the new password emailed to me. And then I log in again and then my phone rings and then I forget what I was doing and I have to go through that all again. And then I get into the email and it says, thanks. Like it's a response to a long thread and that's all it was. And so I think that there is a sense that sometimes this can feel like overkill. Like we are just slowing down and some of this stuff isn't necessary. And we need to find that balance where what is safe enough and what are the threats? And I think Scott can attest to this, but the threats are constantly evolving. And that's one of the problems that they're getting better and better at breaking into our systems and they're phishing and phishing means that they're like looking for private information and they're looking for people to basically just give it up or allow access into a network or a system. And I think sending documents that are um, password protected is a great way to do that. Do, does every single email have to require a password to be read? Probably not. Um, but I think you got to ask yourself in every situation in which you're transmitting something over online, what's the worst thing that could happen here? And I think what we're hearing about in, in many contexts is the worst thing that can happen is really, really bad. Yesterday, Facebook went down for six hours, right? And if they're vulnerable with like billions of dollars in, in network security, then everyone is vulnerable. And so we've got to be looking at this in a new way. Um, it's kind of like when people first started wearing seatbelts, it seemed like such a hassle, like I, nothing's going to happen. I've driven this road like every day to work. Um, and then it just becomes habit, right? Now you can't get into a car without putting on your seatbelt. And that's the kind of thing that we need to look for here solutions that become second nature and result in a much safer and more secure work environment. That's great advice. Thank you so much, Satish. Um, and I guess I'll, I'll move on here. 
you know, are, are there any tips? And, you know, aside from what we have on the screen now, things that we should uh, follow, uh, establish protocols, uh, talking to our IT department and, and any tools that you guys may have in your toolkit that could be useful for the legal community. Um, I, you know, I, I was, you know, thinking about this and I do think that, I mean, I, I would say for tips for you know, IT folks out there, if you, there are on this call is like education, like it's amazing to me how much you know, opportunities for free and low cost education there are now. And I think that that, like, I mean, I, and I haven't investigated as much, but for staff as well, if you're interested in these things, there you know, avail yourself of that. I think that that the more you understand it, the better you're going, the safer you're going to be for yourself and for your clients. Um, one thing. I mean, and I'm sorry. Just one last. Thing, sorry, on on the. I, I just wanted to suggest too, like you know, I, I think we we hit it before, but talking to your IT staff, don't just go out and like do your thing and, and wait to be like, wait for somebody to tell you, you shouldn't do it. And like, this is not, this is not the place to be doing that. I'm sorry. Like me, <laughs> there's a lot at stake for the, you know, our clients, like there, I mean, a data breach could cause someone the could cause them to lose their job, lose public housing, protracted litigation, you know, to be outed publicly about their, you know, gender, sexuality, like they're in, there's innumerable of bad outcomes that our clients could suffer because you decide that you can do it faster and better. And so please work with your IT department. Yes, and we have in the chat, uh, what tools do you have in your toolkit for the less than techie folks? who work in organizations without an IT person. Well, um, we have a very large IT department because we are like a 1500 person organization in New York City, but it never seems like we have enough people and people are always complaining about the lack of IT support. So at a basic level, we use all of the Microsoft tools and we use SharePoint and Office 365. And all of that happened right before the pandemic or maybe during the pandemic, I can't remember anymore. Um, we also have multi-factor authentication that they just rolled out like last week for our email on personal devices. So what does that mean? That means if you wanna check your work email on your phone, you have to confirm your identity in more than one way. So you could get a text message, you can get a code through an app, you can get an email to another account that's also yours. Um, and I think this is a really simple way to make sure you confirm your identity and that no one else can break into your accounts. Um, in terms of like, if you don't have an IT department, I think that could be a real liability for your organization if you're dealing with confidential information uh, and clients. So maybe you've got to figure out with your within your organization and maybe within the board or um, hire a consultant and figure out like do an assessment of your security risks. Um, groups like Just Tech uh, do this work, I'm, I'm quite sure, um, and there are others. So you really wanna make sure that you're not just um, a sitting duck for some kind of breach. And then um, tools that I learned about in talking with this team, um, and I actually downloaded a VPN platform yesterday because I was, um, I, I learned about the importance of having something that protects your access to public Wi-Fi and, um, and your own kind of uh, internet provider from, from looking at what you're doing and what data you're sending. 
And so a VPN kind of creates like a tunnel through which you can access the internet um, and protects you from all the threats that um, might exist. So maybe your office already has an account for a VPN service and you just need the credentials. Um, maybe you already have hotspots that can be deployed and they're just sitting in a drawer somewhere and nobody knows about it and you just have to ask. Maybe there are devices that you can get um, that would allow you to do your work from home and, and you just need to talk to somebody and figure that out. So I think the first thing is find out what's already available and find out how you should be working. Um, like Scott said, don't wait until there's a breach because that's gonna be really bad. Um, it could be bad for your clients. And then figure out like what tools and what, what gaps you may have and try to fill those gaps uh, as efficiently as you can. I have another question in the chat. Um, one tip we got from a state entity was not to respond to emergency emails by forwarding requested information ASAP, but to confirm with an actual person by phone or virtually. What do you guys think about that? Yeah, I, <clears throat> I didn't. I don't see that one on my chat. That's interesting, but. Um, oh, it might have been a direct to me. Oh, OK. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, no, I've had this scenario actually where like one, uh, I responded by chat, like Google chat to one of my colleagues who told me he was overseas and he needed me to send him some money urgently. And so I G chatted him because I got an email and then he was like, yes, I'm really, it's really me and I'm here, <laughs> you know? And then I was like, wait a minute, let me actually send him a text. And he was like, no, don't, you know? So, yeah, I mean, I tell actually in our trainings, we tell staff is like, if you know the person, if you got a sketchy email from someone that, you know, pick up the phone and call them, call their landline, like talk to them on the phone. Yeah. I mean, yeah, because I mean, if they hack the accounts, there's like innumerable different ways that they could try to scam you. That's right. And I think it really goes to some of these phishing emails that we see more and more of and a lot of small organizations almost thought that they were a small fish and that they would never be targeted with this kind of, uh, you know, attacks. And the reality is, is that more and more uh, our staff, we are personally under attack, right? And, and so I, one advice that I can give, and it's the way that I try to carry on when I do see uh, suspicious emails, is really just looking for misspellings looking for, you know, certain little cues within the actual email itself that make you suspicious about whether or not the person who you are accustomed to communicating with probably wouldn't communicate that way. Um, another tip is definitely not forwarding that email, right? You can actually, you know, put someone else at risk. Uh, what we would tell staff at my former uh, position was, take a screenshot of it. Once you take a screenshot of it, that's a different story. It's no longer a risk. If you are questioning it, it's probably best to just throw it out, yeah. put it in the trash and do not open any attachments because this is how your information can become vulnerable. There is another question in the chat. Do you have any security suggestions for organizations that use volunteers who do not have work associated emails? Can we require volunteers to use certain software, et cetera? Should we? Oh, I get, I, we actually have the, this exact thing that we're doing a lot, especially during, um, because of the eviction work that we, our organization had done and during the moratorium and, and rent rental assistance, a lot of organizations that we, like our partner organizations in the community are, very small and not necessarily like using a lot of personal emails and things. And so we actually, with SharePoint, we were able to set up externally facing SharePoint sites that are walled off from our main client sites that they can log into with their personal email. And, but it also requires multi-factor authentication on their part. So it, we did have that minimum security requirement, but like we knew there was no way we could force them to enroll their devices and go through all this. And it would just be like slow things down way too much. 
Um, and we did get some pushback about that, but then once people started using SharePoint online, I mean, that was the other thing is like some of them didn't have Word on their devices, but with with Office 365 online in the cloud, it's just totally free. You, you can edit files there. I mean, the same thing with, I think, you know, Google Gmail would work as well, but unfortunately, you know, and, and Google Drive, but unfortunately in that situation, you have to have a Gmail account. So there may be other options, but that has really been a, a game changer for us. To me, I think that's a really good example of creating low barriers. We don't want to discourage volunteers from joining us and helping us help clients. And if we set up a, you know, something that's too onerous and too strict and too invasive, we risk turning volunteers off and, and making it difficult for people to be engaged with the organization. But at the same time, we have to convince volunteers that this is important. Why are we doing this? And I think there is a dearth of information from IT departments to the frontline staff about the why. Why is this important? And I think some of us just think they're doing it because this is what they think, but they don't know what it's like for us on the front lines. Or they're doing this because um, they like such and such company and they want our organization to buy their product. Or they're doing this because whatever, right? And I think we need our IT folks and um, others to talk. And that's why we're having this event. It's like, we need to all talk and say, why is this important? What are the risks? And what's the lowest kind of friction way to achieve all our goals? All right, um, a related question on the chat. Should we require volunteers to use multi-factor authentication for logging into case management software? We already spend lots of admin time resetting legal server passwords. Well, I think so. Yeah, I think multi-factor authentication, absolutely. If they're touching confidential information, like I don't think that's, you know, I think they should. I mean, but I'm also a, I'm a supporter of like self-service email uh, or, or password changing, you know, so like people should be able to forget their password and set their own password, encourage people to use password managers and rotate their passwords um, and, and require multi-factor authentication, absolutely. I have another question here. We have a single sign-on system with our case management software and email behind that wall with multi-factor authentication. Do you have concerns about using public Wi-Fi such as a hotel with that setup? I mean, I think there is, I don't think that, I think it, within the past VPNs were like m more essential because the traffic before we had encrypted traffic like SSL encryption for most websites, almost all websites now that we interact with. So the traffic is encrypted. But I mean, that said, like, if you're just doing your own thing, and you're like browsing websites, I think that's fine. But if you're dealing with client data here, it's as important you it, and the VPNs are not hard to use. So I think do it, you know, like, it should be, even though you're using single sign on, I mean, there, it, it actually is a known, there is a known risk to even in that scenario to using a public Wi-Fi. Okay, that's great. Thank you both. Um, if there are more questions, please drop them in the chat. Um, do you guys have any additional advice um, around this topic? Um, I know uh, Scott touched on this very briefly, but we have on the screen, avoid shadow IT. What, what does that mean? So yeah, I, this is a term I learned recently in the last couple of years, but um, basically the shadow IT is like when, when you, like in this scenario, in our fact pattern, you're saving files to your Gmail, your, your like Google Drive, 
maybe you set up your own Dropbox with another organization um, where you're going to share files like with um, opposing, you know, or, or not a, like a pro bono attorney or whatever. It's like basically anything you're not telling your IT department about, but where you're like doing work, organizational work. So that's kind of the idea behind shadow IT. It's like we ideally, and it, and it, it kind of, it, it goes along with this idea of like information governance. Like we want to know where our information is and we want to be able to, con and, and when, if we know where it is, then we have a better chance to be able to control it, know when it's being accessed, getting it back if there's a data breach, <clears throat> just, you know, investigating problems. If, if you, you know, you might have the created the best system for yourself, but if it's like one that your IT department doesn't know about and can't access and has no governance over, then that's going, it very likely is going to not end well, unfortunately. Okay. So we've talked a lot about risk. We've talked a lot about tips and what we can do. What, what's the silver lining? I'm a little stressed out. I feel like I don't have control over, you know, my tech setup. I was confident before and now I'm questioning, am I doing it the right way? Is there a silver lining uh, behind this conversation? I think, um, and then Scott, obviously you can weigh in on this too. If we do this right, we open up the door to a new way of working. We don't need to go to offices and sit at our desks and stare at a you know, beige box all day long. Um, we can work from anywhere. We can really be free. We can work like flexible hours. We can take emails from like soccer practice or waiting for the dentist or um, you know at a guitar lesson or whatever you want to do like this can really open up you know a universe of possibilities for the way we work but on the other hand this could really backfire if we see like a series of breaches um, somebody's in trouble um, if we see a series of breaches then you know these freedoms that we've been accustomed to during the pandemic are gonna be taken away. Like we are gonna build a case against this new model of working. And so if we all participate now, we can build a safe way to work and really benefit from it in the future. Yeah, I, absolutely, I, I, I agree. And I, I, I mean, I think there's a lot of trepidation in our organization about the use of personal devices. And I, I think that some of that has gone away and some of it, but, you know, certain, we've had a, a couple of bad incidents with it too. So it's like, that's, that's the other thing about being, when you're using your personal device for work, like be, be, you know, conscientious about it. Don't try to be like downloading torrent movies and, you know, like, <laughs> you know, don't just, you know, try to think about, like what, what could go wrong? Like, okay, you know, what malicious software might accidentally get installed on my, you know, while I'm, you know, checking out, you know, whatever like application I think looks good or whatever, like, and if I've got client, if I've got access to client data on my computer, if I've got like it in one drive and it's opened up and I accidentally share that what if you accidentally share that on a peer-to-peer -peer network, you know, and you're connected to literally like your organization SharePoint site? I mean, it's frightening. Like some of these things that's like that could go wrong. So, yeah, we all have a part to play in making for sure we can get to this future. And, and you know, so and I and, and it, it, it's there's no there's just no easy answer. So I'm <laughs> I hope I'm not leaving you all. This doesn't sound like a silver lining. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, I think the silver lining is like, yeah, I think we can get to this place, but like we, it's still in process. Like we, you know, I think encryption is a big, going to be a big part of this where we can, even if, even if bad actors got these files, like they couldn't do anything with them because they can't log in and they can't authenticate and encrypt and see that, see them. So like, I, I mean, but 
this is going to take a lot more development of the technology. Microsoft is still working on it. It's still buggy. You know, there's still got a lot of stuff in preview. So it's like, we're, we're, we're getting there, you know, but it's, it's going to still take a few more years. I have one, well, it looks like two questions that I'm going to try to address very quickly as we come up on the hour. So what alternatives to having a text sent to your personal say, uh, cell phone for two-factor authentication can be used when the company does not provide phones or they're not available? Um, I mean, I, I'm thinking just for myself, uh, a couple of, uh, I want to say one or two years back, I started to switch even my personal devices onto authenticator apps um, instead of receiving a text message to, authentic to authenticate myself. Um, I think it's so scary. A, a couple of months ago, uh, T-Mobile got hacked. You know, some of our clients might have gotten hacked and their information might be up there and up in the cloud. Um, and now, you know, the fear is some people can take control of even our cell phone accounts and call and, and act as if they are us with the information that they have obtained and get access to some of those codes that are sent to our phones. And so I think that as Scott and Satish have mentioned, we have to continue to read about, um, educate ourselves around security and what are the, the best steps um, I think auth authenticator apps could be something that you can talk to your IT department about and whether that is uh, a suggestion or an alternative to getting text messages. Uh, Scott, Satish, do you have anything to add with regard to that? No, I mean, I, I don't think there is anything else I would add other than um, echoing that, you know, this is a new frontier and we have to be thinking about this stuff more than ever and it's going to really pave the road ahead and allow us to do a lot more allow us to help a lot more people i mean fundamentally we're here because we want to serve people um, and help them with their legal needs and we're going to be able to do more of that if we do this all in the right way do you have any written best practices or models for a clean desk policy for remote workers that you can share or maybe quick tips, maybe that, that'll be a, a to-do for a toolkit. <laughs> I mean, I, we just finished. I was finished. just gonna say oh. really quick, quick plug um, at the end of the security series, um, which will be at the end of this year in December, we will be um, combining okay. all of these recordings and um, a, um, com excuse me, compiling best practices um, like the one that was just asked for. Um, so just stay tuned for that in the toolkit that'll be coming out um, at the end of the year. Thank you, Latidra. That's perfect. And uh, I have one more comment. We recently implemented multi-factor authentication for some staff. Um, they were using personal phones. Um, so they're offering a FOB yeah. device um, that can be synced with specific user accounts. Do you all have any thoughts about that setup? So, yeah, I mean, I think that probably what you're talking about like is a UB key, which is like USB security device, which is basically like stores kind of like a long, very, very long unhackable password on the, on the hardware device. So you just, you can use that as a means of multi-factor authentication. And it is actually considered the most secure way to um, use multi-factor. In fact, because it's not, it doesn't come over any cell network. It's like something you carry around and you hold in your hand. And so, and we, because we use G Suite that we, I've locked my account down. They require two hardware keys in case you lose one to, to enter into their, uh, I forget what they call, it, but they're super security, like unhackable account status or whatever. So they, it is a, it's a great idea. I also, I wanted to say before about like, I think using phone apps is like the way to go. I mean, if you've listened to any, like no by four, no before we, which we don't use, but I listen to their, your uh, um, webinars all the time about, you know, is like you can, you know, unfortunately people multi-factor is hacked like regularly through SMS. It's like, it's becoming more, as it becomes more and more common for people to be on multi-factor, they're going to go after it with SMS. And so if you're using 
you know, apps or YubiKeys, you're going to be much safer. Thank you, Scott. Let's see, I think I... Um, says, what we are using is different than a USB device. It is a safe ID, oath compliant hardware token device. Yeah, it sounds, I mean, it sounds like a similar, you know, uh, type of yeah, device, yes. Well, thank you all for all the great questions and comments. Uh, we asked you all to participate in our poll and I'm so curious to see what we have all answered. I did participate myself. <laughs> Latitra, do you think you can give us uh, the results of our poll? Can everyone, can you see them? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you so much. So to use a personal device for any work purposes, and I think most of us do sometimes, right? We're, we're all being honest here. <laughs> um, we do have 28% that never uses a personal device and that's super commendable. I applaud you all. And 26% that use a personal device all the time. So I think it's it's just very clear to us that use it sometimes or use personal device all the time to really consider best practices while using personal devices. Have you ever used a personal account for work purposes? 69% uh, say no. And 31% say yes. Our next question, do you ever use public Wi-Fi when working? 78% of, uh, of our audience said no, and only 22% said yes. So you follow your organization's policy to securely share sensitive confidential information with clients. And I think there's a winner here, 76% uh, said yes. My organization does not have a sharing policy um, or I do not know my organization's share, uh, sharing policy. So we had a few that fell into that population as well. So for those that do not know of the data sharing um, policy, please go back to your organization and have those conversations with IT. They are the key members to you know, give you insight on best practices. Um, our last question, when was the last time you attended a cybersecurity training? And it looks like 60% have attended a cybersecurity training within the last three to six months. I think that's awesome. Um, and definitely our recommendation um, here. Uh, over a year ago, I, I don't know, Scott, Satish, if you have you know, best practices, I like to keep on the up and up with my cybersecurity personally. <laughs> but yeah. um, I think the usual is once a year. But more is never bad. <laughs> so it seems like we've been preaching to the choir today because many of the attendees here, um, the majority have been engaging in very, very good practices. Um, it's the challenge of, of you know, all of us to convey this to everyone else who didn't attend today. Um, and probably it's a self-selected group, right? Um, the average person who works within our organizations isn't gonna be necessarily interested in attending this, but those of us who already know about it and are, and are aware of its importance are here, obviously. So we need to spread this information and the urgency of this issue um, throughout our organizations. Great, and Scott, any last words before, and if anyone else has any questions, please, please, please share through chat. Um, any last words around this topic? Uh, no, no, thank you all for, you know, um, listening to, to us. And like, you know, I, you, it sounds like you're our ambassadors and like it, arming you with this, you know, these thoughts, I hope, you know, of how we can, you know, move, move better, you know, move better in the world and do our work and live our personal lives and you know get it done you know, because I mean we got a lot of work to do I think we all know that <laughs> definitely 
Well, thank you, Scott and Satish, for all of your amazing advice and tips and for taking the time to speak to us. Um, and for all of our uh, attendees, thank you for attending uh, Best Security Practices for Advocates Working Remotely. I want to remind you to join us, LSNTAP, uh, October 19th. There is a 3 p.m. session on security assessments for legal aid. You can register at www.lsntap.org forward slash events. Thank you again. You guys have a great day. Thank you.